Welcome everyone to the final episode of season two of the Runners Roundtable. I've had so many incredible conversations with different female run coaches, and I'm really excited today to be joined by Coach Fontana De Pasquale, partly because your Instagram page is one of my favorite Instagram pages. I was actually just stalking your page before oh, you. you logged on <laughs> because it's such a plethora of information that I can tell you really take your time to not only do the research yourself, but then communicate it with people in a way that they understand. And I feel like you do something that not a lot of other people do. And it's, this goes back to like uh, an issue I have with social media is that oftentimes people will post things and be like, this works for everyone. This is what it is without really adding that disclaimer that, oh, this is what works for me or this works for certain people. So there's something in the way that you present the information that feels generalized, but not specific, but also really accessible. So I just wanted to start off by thanking you for all the time that I'm sure goes into your social media account, into getting the graphics together, into getting all that information together. Because for me, as someone who's watching it, it's, I can tell that one, you know, your stuff, but also that you acknowledge there are so many different ways to approach being a runner and so many different ways to engage with a run coach. So before we get to how your social media came about, how you made those really intentional choices, can you tell us your running story, when you started running and how you've evolved as a runner since? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored um, to be on the podcast, honored to be the final guest uh, wrapping up your season. And thank you so much for all the kind words about my social media. And those are, those are exactly my goals. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I've been an online running coach for, gosh, I was just, it's been about five years now, which blows my mind. I've been coaching for longer than that. So um, prior to that, I, in the past, before coaching online, I've worked in the high school space. Um, I've coached um, at the D1 level in college, and I've done internships with professional running groups. I've done internships at the Olympic Training Center. Um, I love running. I eat, sleep, and breathe it. Also have healthy balance, um, but I love, you know, I, I truly love what I do and I love the running community. Prior to that, um, I was a D1 college runner. I also ran competitively in high school. So um, yeah, I've been at this for a long time. I've been running myself for 15 plus years now. Um, and I'm very blessed to have this be my career. How'd you get into run coaching in specific? So coming out of college, my goal was I had, um, I have my degree in psychology with an emphasis on, um, my school didn't have a concrete sports psychology program, but I took every sports psychology class that they had. I did my thesis, final thesis on sports psychology topics. Um, and I wanted to, my goal was to be a D1, um, a D1 college coach for cross country and track for the rest of my life. Um, I did that for a year coming out of college. So I started down that like funnel of college coaching, started as volunteer assistant at Michigan State. I learned so much, such an incredible experience. And I was with them the year after their women's team won the national championship. So just super like to be immersed in that environment and witness these like really high performing women. Um, just such an amazing learning experience and so inspirational. Um, but that lifestyle is, you know, I realized that D1 coaching lifestyle, just very, very tough. Um, it is a three running is a three season sport in college. So distance runners do cross country and then indoor track and then outdoor track. And, you know, that's so fun as an athlete, it's very tough as a coach because you're always on. And so every single weekend is, you know, just such a grind. You're traveling for meets or you're away recruiting. You're up late at night, you know, doing recruiting calls. And I knew I wanted um, just a little bit more balance in my life. So after that year, I kind of took a pause, went into the corporate world and actually went into marketing. So that has informed a lot of, that's been really helpful for 
part of why I love like social media and having fun with some of the graphics and things I create. That's my marketing background uh, coming into play. But that itch to coach never really went away. And I found myself thinking more and more about it as I kind of worked through the corporate world and was connected with um, Mary Johnson of Lift, Run, Perform. I actually like kind of serendipitously met her at a, um, a event that I was at followed up with her a few days later, just kind of had my brain turning. And I was like, Hey, you know, is there any chance that you might have availability on your roster might be willing to take on an extra run coaching, an extra run coach. Um, and that was the event that got me back into coaching and specifically in the online space. So I started with them in 2018, 2018. I can't believe that was five years ago. Um, and just started very much part-time, never had any ambitions of doing this full time of leaving, leaving my job in the corporate world. Um, but it was just so fun and fulfilling. And then, you know, as my client roster slowly grew, um, I just found myself like that was all I wanted to do. And so a few years in, um, made the transition to doing this full time. And then a year or two after that made the transition to owning my own business, um, which is coach Montana de Pasquale. That is a journey, right? Like, and I feel Very like- Very long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> well, and it's so, I, I think the first question that came up for me was, how is it different coaching collegiate athletes versus the people you coach right now, right? Because I think of it, even here, I, I didn't, I wasn't clear on- what the season was for collegiate athletes. So I'm like, holy smokes, indoor track, outdoor track, and cross country. That is, talk about just a different way to coach someone, but also the pressure maybe is different. So I'm curious to know, how is that experience for you as a coach different from being at college to now coaching the people you coach? Yeah. So it's fun. I mean, honestly, one thing that I've really enjoyed, like when I started online coaching, I just, I came from that more like high performance world. And so I thought like, not that I wanted to pigeonhole myself in that, but that was what I knew and what I really enjoyed. Um, and I have had so much fun. I truly, I love working. I work with everyone from like very beginners, like people who've never ever identified as a runner um, and are like, we're starting from ground zero scratch. And I work with people who are fall more on that high performing spectrum. So like female sub three hour marathoners, male, you know, 245 ish beyond marathoners. Um, and I work with everyone in between and I have so much fun. And I, I know some coaches, um, which I think is great. Some coaches like have a particular specialty, like they like working with a specific population, whether it's more of the beginners, more of the high performers, more of the middle of the packers. And I don't think I could ever choose. So that's been such a, like, Again, I don't want to say surprise, but having come from like, again, that more like high performance world, I could never pick one. I love having folks across the whole end of the spectrum. And it's so fulfilling to get to work with like, to kind of dip my hands in all these different, you know, pockets and style of training and working with people with all different needs. Um, but to answer your question, differences would be with a school system with like the collegiate as an example um system and even high school as well like you're just more locked in um you have a certain racing cadence so like you know you're running you have to do cross country and indoor and outdoor track and with my adult runners we have the liberty of choosing our own seasons um and that is something that i give people guidance on because i have folks who i call serial racers like they just want to race all the time year round like even more than the collegiate season um, the structure, which I think is racing a lot. Um, so some of those folks I do have to hold back, but it, from optimizing performance, um, from an optimizing performance standpoint, it's really advantageous to be able to only have a few key races per year, because we know that the body can only peak like two to three times per year max. So it really, I think it, adult runners are at an advantage in that way. Like they don't have to have these three peaks per year, which is really stressful on the body. Yeah. And I think that's so, so lovely to hear for, for someone like me, right. And a lot of people that I'm sure who listen to these episodes where we came to running later in life or were new at running, or we're still kind of finding that rhythm of running, of mm -hmm. knowing that I think of the people who want to run 
And I'm curious to hear if you have, if you've had this experience where people who want to run, but they don't run because they say that they're not fast enough. So to hear you say that, it's like, okay, but yeah, wait a minute. Let's, let's unpack that a little bit because your training is, is different. You don't have to look like an elite runner, run like an elite runner to have a quote unquote elite performance for you in your body. Do you have a lot of people that have come to you that are, you know, questioning whether they can be runners? Yes. Yes. And the biggest thing that I tell, um, so like when you say that, you're probably imagining or probably everyone is thinking about like those brand new beginner runners who have never identified as runners, but, um, have never identified with runners in the past, but want to, um, the biggest thing that I tell those folks is that I hear that sentiment from people of a huge spectrum of paces. So the feeling of being a runner is not tied to like people. A lot of people think once I achieve X pace, I will be a runner. Um, once I achieve, um, you know, once I can run every day, which doesn't need to be a goal for anyone or even most people. Um, but you know, whatever that like goal is, once I achieve X goal, then I'll be a runner. People who have achieved all of those goals, many of them still don't think of themselves as runners. So it's like that, like imposter syndrome. It's that is not connected to pace. It's not connected. It's truly just you making a decision to call yourself a runner. And that's all it is. And that often feels really comforting to those brand new or beginner runners. Um, is that, you know, it's not anything external that you should be. It needs to start with you, you know, making the decision to identify as a runner. Um, and if you just tie it to some external thing, you, there's a good chance you're not going to feel like a runner, even when you, you know, achieve those things. I appreciate you saying that so much because I had in the last season of this podcast, or rather the very first episode that I did was, um, who's a runner or something along the lo- those lines where it was myself and three other run coaches. And we just talked about what does it mean to be a runner? what, what is that definition for everyone? And that was something that in that discussion, and even in reflection of my own history as a runner was really, really clear that it wasn't the distance. It wasn't the paces. It wasn't the races. It wasn't any of that, that determined when I felt like a runner. It was very much. So I felt like a runner the minute I took ownership of that word runner. And I had brought up how when I first started running, I really loved the process of running. Like I found a run group that was so awesome. And I enjoyed my long runs with them so much that before I had even ran one half marathon, I had signed up for three because again, I loved the process so much. And even after doing those three, even after doing more half marathons, running a marathon, it still felt, and I love that you brought up imposter syndrome because it really did feel like that where I was like, who am I to say I'm a runner? Like I do this for fun. Does that, I'm not a runner. Like I had it in my mind that there was a certain level of seriousness that I had to take in order to be a runner. Looking back now, and I'm sure you'll agree with this statement where I put in the time and I put in the effort. I was consistent. I was dedicated. I was motivated. Those were all qualities that made me a runner. It wasn't the crossing the finish line. It wasn't the pace. It wasn't the miles per week. It was the commitment that I was making to myself to show up to each run that made me a runner. It was the changes that I was making in my life so that I could feel good when I ran so that I could recover well after a run. That's what made me a runner. So I just absolutely love that you shared that because that is something that for some reason we put it up. And when I say we, I just mean the universal we. We put that up as a barrier for ourselves of entering the sport or feeling like this is something that I can do for myself. And how do you address that with your runners? Is it just as simple as you telling them, Hey, it has nothing to do with pace. It has nothing. Cause it is sometimes I feel like as a coach, you can walk alongside them, 
but ultimately they have to be the ones to make that conclusion. Yeah, absolutely. I love everything you said. And I love um, taking ownership of the word. That's such a powerful, I love the way you put that. That's such a powerful way to describe it. So I agree. Yes. It's me. Like as a coach, I feel like my job is to walk alongside the person and guide them as best as I can. That actually has been kind of brings up for me. That's as I reflect on my five years of online coaching and some of the big things that I've learned, um, that's been a big shift, I guess, in my, like uh, the way that I approach things with people. Um, so just trying to guide them versus telling them in any decision we may make with our running. Um, so when I was starting out in the online coaching space, you know, I, having the technical knowledge I have and the knowledge of programming and training and how many times you can peak per year and whatever. Like I had certain ideas in my head of what correct training looks like or what the right way to do things is. And that's all well and good. But now I try to approach it as I have all that knowledge. I'm that informs, you know, my expertise and what I'm able to bring to the table with athletes. But the best thing that I can do is just kind of give them all of the facts, right? Give them the knowledge I have, talk things through with them, counsel them, but then let them make their own decisions. Even if that's not necessarily, um, even if that's not necessarily the decision I would make or the decision that I would make for them, but at least they have all the facts. And sometimes athletes just have to learn some things for themselves. I've had athletes where, you know, we'll have these conversations of like, you are a runner, you, you are doing it. Like, look at you, you are committing to the process. You're being intentional about your training. And sometimes, you know, we just have to wait for that aha moment to come. Um, and that's okay. So everyone is on their different path to, you know, acceptance about being a runner and thinking of themselves as a runner. Um, and, you know, in a similar way, people are on, you know, that, that goes, that's true for their whole running journey. Um, and any decisions they may make around their running. Um, but very similar is I encourage people to, I also encourage people to treat themselves like an athlete and to train like an athlete. That's a phrase I use a lot with my athletes. And to me, it brings a very similar concept. So train like an athlete. Um, it can kind of be an uncomfortable word for people to claim. And I get it. Like as someone who was a high school and college athlete, you know, I look at myself, I'm now a mom. I have all these, I'm a business owner, an entrepreneur. I have all these other demands on my time. And it's kind of like, it feels a little unsettling to sit with that word. Like, am I, am I really an athlete still? Like I used to be an athlete, you know, my life looks very different now. Um, in my opinion, if you ask a million different people to define an athlete, you will get a million different responses and what an athlete actually is, is not really important. Um, it's irrelevant. If you, I think that if you engage in training in an intentional way, I, I think to me, that is an, that is an athlete. If you train on purpose, you are an athlete. If you train with intention, you are an athlete, but regardless doing, treating yourself like an athlete will make you a better runner. It will make you more like an athlete. And that is what is important to me. So similar to what you talked about of your journey with reclaiming the word, with claiming the word runner and maybe claiming the word athlete, when you claim that word, it typically has a big cascade effect. So when you think of yourself as a runner, when you think of yourself as an athlete, you're going to start doing all of the things that runners and athletes do. You're going to start probably eating better, fueling, um, you know, fueling before and after your runs, um, not skipping meals, um, maybe starting to go to bed a little bit early, um, thinking more about gear, like all of these things that are then going to have again, a cascade effect and make you a better runner. So I just think it's such a positive thing all around. I think what exactly a runner is, what exactly an athlete is, is kind of like an irrelevant, you know, we can debate that all day long. Um, but striving to be whatever that looks like for you is I think what's important. Yeah. And all this, it's just, <laughs> I'm smiling, listening to you speak. Cause I'm like, Oh, that's the psychology. The psychology is coming out. Here's where we can kind of see that bit of background. And even that the sports psychology in particular of the power of words and the power of us claiming those words for ourselves and then how those words seep into our thoughts, which then seep into our actions, which then ripples out to everything around us. Yeah. And it is really interesting. I like to refer to people as well as, as athletes. And even in these conversations, I'm like athletes, athletes, because being a runner means more than just running. You're not just out there. You're, there's a lot of other stuff that has to intentionally happen in order for you to run at the capacity in which you want to run without getting injured, without feeling burnt out. There's so much that goes into it. So I really appreciate that you bring up the athlete part. And that makes me think of 
uh, Dr. Stacy Sims, if you're familiar with her, that is her definition of athlete. If you do it on purpose and with intention, you're an athlete. And I love that that's part of your messaging because that is something really, really important for people to hear. Again, it goes back with anything where you don't have to look a certain way or be able to do things a certain way in order for you to be the runner, to be an athlete. I definitely embraced the word runner a lot quicker than I embraced the word athlete because it's when I thought of a runner, I thought of someone that was fast, that was tinier than me or skinnier than me or whatever the case was, you know, very much so the picture of an elite athlete, of an elite runner is kind of what came to mind. And it was very similar with thinking of athlete. When I thought of athlete, I thought of, oh yeah, people who get scholarships to to do their athletic performances, their athletic work, people who get paid to do this stuff. And it really did take a bit of time to think about that of understanding there, there are other, the cascade effect of it, right. Of there are other things in my life that I am switching around, moving around to accommodate this movement to accommodate again, like the, the amount of rest that I need, the amount of recovery that I need, the mobility work that I need, the stability work that I need in order to do that. So it was one of those things where it's, where I started to become more in awe of myself because here I am. And like you said, you know, you're a mom and you're a business and there's all this other stuff. And now we're fitting running in, we're fitting these athletic activities into a life that is pretty full already. There's a lot like there's, we're making space. And for myself, it's making space for the runs to happen, the strength workouts to happen. It is also making sacrifices for those things to happen in my case. And I've shared this before where I'm training for a marathon, which means that on Friday nights, I go to bed very early and I miss out on Friday night family time because I'm going to bed early. And those are things where once I stopped to think about it, I was like, wait, but I am an athlete. Like I, I'm, I'm doing I'm putting in the same effort into showing up as best as I can as whatever idea of athlete or runner I had in my mind. And I'm doing that without some of the perks that those people have, right? Like we're cooking our own meals. I, you know, I have to pay for a physical therapist. I have to pay for massages. (laughs) That stuff isn't provided to me. And even then those things have to fit into a schedule that's already full of other stuff. So I really love that that you brought that up because I hope that people can hear your words, hear my experience, and maybe find something in there that does reflect their experience so that they can start to claim those words and embrace those words for themselves. Absolutely. Yeah, sorry. No, I was going to say. No, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, I think in my opinion, being an adult athlete is so much more impressive because like you said, you're, you're making these hard decisions. You are, you have so many more demands on your times and you're still showing up. You're still making it a priority. You're still making, you know, you're making extra sacrifices to make the work happen and nothing's being handed to you. So it's adult athletes are like awe inspiring to me. And it's, again, it's why it's such a joy getting to do what I do and seeing people, just willingly and consistently making those sacrifices, showing up and seeing that pay off for them. But yeah, I, I mean, I would say to people like, don't let that imposter syndrome hold you back because you were doing extra and you're doing it and you're, you know, it's, it's just super impressive. Yeah. I want everyone to just remember that (laughs) as adult athletes, we are doing extra. We are doing extra. So for someone who's interested in working with you, what does that process look like? Are they reaching out to you via Instagram, your website? Is there a consultation? How do you determine whether an athlete is a good fit for you and whether you're a good fit for the athlete? 
Yeah. So, um, there's a few different ways that people can work with me. So I have, um, one-on-one -on -one run coaching services. I also have power hour services. Um, and then I have strength training programs for runners. So my one-on-one -on -one coaching, I have two different tiers that I work with folks with. Um, I take athletes on for either six or 12 months at a time. I have people that I've been working with for, like, I have people that have gone back from the five years. Like I've been working with them for the better part of five years now. Um, I have some folks who just have like, you know, we reach their goals within six to 12 months. They've gotten everything they want out of it. And then we part ways. Um, but again, I do have folks who, you know, renew well and well beyond their contracts. Um, as you know, with running, the reason my model, my model is set up the way it is, as you know, with running is it's just such a, it's such a long game. Um, so, you know, if you're in it looking for like a quick fix or you want like a guaranteed PR in 60 days, you know, there's no guarantees. I can't guarantee that. I can guarantee you'll see progress in 60 days, but, um, you know, my, I I'm looking for people who are willing to, you know, um, do who want to do things the right way and are willing to kind of play the long game a little bit because that's where the big results happen. Um, for folks who maybe are not looking for or not looking for or don't need the like one on one kind of more high touch support of one on one coaching, I have power hours. Um, and that's where you get one hour with me via zoom. And we do um, a full deep dive on your training history, what is causing you to feel stuck, um, whether it's you know, you just want like an expert set of eyes, like a third party set of eyes on your training. And we, you know, do an audit and dial into what exactly you might need to improve. And then you just want to take things and run with things from there, you'd be a great fit for a power hour. I also do power hour services for postpartum runners. So once you've been cleared for, um, at that six week postpartum appointment, and you're looking to get back to running safely, we'll come up with a custom, we'll assess where you're at, look at what your pregnancy training history has looked like. If you did run at all during your pregnancy mm -hmm. and come up with a custom return to running plan for you it can be really helpful for those new moms who are tired, don't have a lot of brain space to figure this out by themselves. Um, and, want, you know, don't want to have to kind of dig and figure it all out online. Um, so those are my power hour services. Um, and then I also offer strength training. Um, I have PDF based strength training programs for runners, and I have a new app based, um, program and community for, um, runners for strength training. Most people find me Instagram and social media is the number one driver of new clients for me, which is why I show up there so much and try to put out as much great free content as I can. And it's also just Instagram and social media is so fun to the running community is so fun. So I've met so many great folks that way. Um, but um, I have links on my social media accounts to my website where you can book any of those services or inquire. And if you were interested in say one-on-one -on -one run coaching for that, we would have a consult. Um, we would have a consult first to see if we're a good fit. I love that you have all those offerings. I've never seen anyone. I've seen it in other industries, the power hour concept that you have. So I love that you offer that for people because I think that is also a nice entry point for some people when it comes to run coaching, where they're not ready to commit for six to 12 months, but they do need a little bit of guidance. And that's also a great way for them to kind of pick your brain and like an extended interview as well for both of you. Right. I, it's so funny. Cause I, you know, I had asked, or you had mentioned how you like to work with, with everybody and that you wouldn't be able to pick. And in my mind, I, like, I just had this realization. I'm like, ah, but here's where you draw your line with the people you work with in terms of time frame. of, yes. are you someone that is willing to dedicate six months, 12 months to me, to not even to me, but like to this relationship and to seeing the progress, because that's something that it's been a theme throughout all these conversations. I've said it so many times where a run coach is more than a training plan. If you just want a training plan, there's plenty of resources online that you can find something that kind of fits. Yep. But also even for run coaching that goes for a specific race, the more I have these conversations, the more I kind of take issue with that of like, oh, let's just train you for this race. Cause I'm like, but wait, there's a whole recovery period that we need to kind of get into. There's a whole base building period that would be really, really helpful, not only for your development as an athlete, but also for our development in a relationship together. Because with each run that the athlete does, that the person does, 
that's giving you information as to how they can handle the stress of the run. How are they balancing that run with everything else that they have in their life? So I love that that is something that you're very clear on of here's six months and here's 12 months. In which distance or for what circumstances would you tell someone, hey, I think we would be a better fit for a six month as opposed to we should work together for 12 months? Yeah, um, good question. So that is typically um, led by the athlete. I let them choose. Um, so it all depends on like what the person's goals are. And quite frankly, um, again, I do tend to have good renewal rate, regardless of the six or 12 month commitment. Sometimes the six month folks are maybe like a little more gun. I would say most of the people who sign on for six months are just a little bit more like 12 months just sounds like a long time to commit to a coach or two. And they want to test the waters a little bit. Um, and then they'll renew or, you know, maybe they meet their goals and they're good from there. Um, but yeah, I let, I let the person decide and it all depends on, um, what they're, you know, what specific races they're training for, what exactly they're hoping to get out of, um, what exactly they're hoping to get out of coaching. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Cause I feel like trying to think of a lot of the coaching services that I've seen, or even for myself, you know, you, you really do run the gamut with, we can do month to month, we can yep. do three months, we can do for a race or a training cycle or the six month or 12 months. So it really, really does run the gamut. And that is definitely, you know, coach preference. And I think also to your point of it's an athlete kind of preference, because these are, I feel like people will come into a run coaching relationship. And I, I totally put myself in this little bucket as well, where initially what I was really aware of was the cost of yeah. it. And yeah. how much is the upfront cost of this particular service, right? Because in the beginning, it's just a service until you actually start working with the coach, you start seeing the training programs, you start giving feedback, you start receiving feedback. Then you realize, oh, this coach is totally worth it. Like, okay, this, this, I, I mean, at this point, I've been with my coach for some time too. And anytime I get the renewal notice, I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Like I don't even bat an eyelash because I've reaped the benefit from it, or I've started to see that coaching is more than just the training plan. Yep. Do you talk to the athletes about that and explain to them, yes, here's a training plan or here's a, an approach. Mm -hmm. but what you'll get out of this is more than just knowing what you're going to do on Monday, more than just knowing what you're going to do on Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I tell athletes when I write from when I onboard them that the, the more communicative you can be with me, the more successful that we're going to be. Um, and that's, I mean, part of that is like building trust. So, you know, it, it, that's another reason why I ask people to commit to six to 12 months is relationships take time. Um, the work takes time and relationships take time to build and grow. Um, so the, you know, the more communication that's happening, um, the better, you know, the better and more successful we're going to be. So I, I, I tell that to everyone. Um, and part of my job is my job is not just to write training. It's to help you adjust training to your life. So if something's not working, if you're consistently struggling to meet runs or you're getting stuck with runs, like you're seeing these quality sessions loom, these speed workouts loom on your schedule and they just feel like a, you know, black cloud over your head every single week. Like what can we do to make them feel a little bit more approachable? Um, what can we do to, you know, um, you know, whether that's giving you mental tips or tricks and me helping kind of guide you through some of those or making actual training or programming tweaks, that is the difference of having a coach. It's not meant to be a static training plan service. Yeah. I love that. That just makes me so happy because it's a, <laughs> it's a relationship between two human beings. And yeah. yes, it's about something like running, but ultimately it is a relationship. And I say this as well, where your plan is a living, breathing thing. It yes. is going to adjust with you. It is going to adapt to you. One of my favorite questions that I love to ask, because again, part of the reason why I've been having these conversations is so that people can really understand that coach, athlete, coach, runner, it is a relationship and a lot of relationship dynamics that show up in other relationships will show up in the relationship with your coach. So how do you handle, or have you had to handle conflict in the coach athlete relationship. And an example could be, you notice that 
your athlete is not doing the speed workouts and that not really communicating with you why they're not doing it, or maybe they're taking all their easy runs and making them harder runs, right? How do you have those conversations? And those, again, those are difficult conversations to have with an athlete of checking in on them, of trying to understand how do you approach those conversations and yeah, how do you approach them? And what what what's usually the outcome of having maybe more challenging conversations with your athletes? Yeah, so I, I mean, to me, that's, I don't even consider that conflict. I, first of all, I just, I feel so lucky. I work with so many amazing people. Um, and if I see something like that um, going on, I try to approach it from a standpoint of curiosity. Um, so like, what is, you know, okay, like this is, this seems strange. This person's consistently missing this round. What's going on? Try to approach it from an attitude of curiosity and checking in with them and say like, Hey, like what's coming up for you that this is, you know, it seems like it's been difficult for you to get in these runs or, Hey, I noticed that you're, you know, consistently running very fast when you're, you know, faster than prescribed on your easy days. Like what is, what's going on there? What can we do to, um, sometimes it's a lot of times it's them just like not understanding the purpose of the workout, Mm -hmm. um, not understanding the purpose of easy running. So that's a great opportunity for me as a coach to educate them. Um, I have conversations with, um, some of like, I alluded to earlier, my serial racers, the people who just like love setting up for like a million races. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa okay. <laughs> now we've got a packed racing schedule. And I, you know, this is like a little bit more of a racing frequency than I'm comfortable with. Um, I, I try not to like in that situation, I wouldn't say like, no, I would never say like, no, you can't do that race. I would just try to educate them on like, you know, this is a lot of races totally fine, but let's just pick and choose which races we want to be at our best and then assign a concrete purpose for the other races. And I just want to make sure you're comfortable with having some races where we're not, the goal is not to go all out or PR because we can't PR in every race. Um, so I try to, yeah, approach, I try to meet them where they're at. I try to approach it from an attitude of curiosity. Um, and it's, I mean, because the people I work with are, are great, you know, it's, and they're, they hire me because they want to improve like their understanding we have, we end up often having like really great conversations as a result of, you know, situations like that. Yeah. If there's, if there's a situation where someone is like, I guess like an, an example of conflict, like if there's a situation where we're just like, for some reason, just like really, this has happened a very, very small handful of times, maybe like, we're just, not kind of on the same page. They're having trouble grasping, you know, what I'm explaining, even when I'm trying to approach it from an attitude of curiosity, you know, that might be a situation where we're like, Hey, you know, maybe I'm just not the best fit for you. Mm-hmm. I have some fabulous colleagues and here's someone else I would recommend you to. Um, but again, that is, that is very rare. And more often than not situations like that do, they can sometimes create good breakthroughs for both of us. Yeah. And I love that you say curiosity. Curiosity is one of my like top values like that. It's up there. One of the pillars of my val- my values. And awesome. that's very much so how I try to approach everything where it's curiosity, because sometimes it really is just that you're, you're either missing important information or the athlete is needing some education about something. I've just found that in my experience, I've had people they kind of ghost me where I'm like, wait, no, it's okay. Like it's, it's, you don't have to come up with excuses for me. You don't have to try to explain things away. It's, it's more, I'm just trying to understand because this training plan, this is here for you and it's supposed to serve you and your goals. And if it's not, let's figure out what needs, what needs to be done or, or even, I, there have definitely been situations where I've had to give people kind of permission to let me go of like, all right, it, if it's not working, it's totally fine. And that's kind of where these difficult conversations for me have happened, where the desire to run and to have a coach is there, but the action that would be in alignment with that desire is not there. Yeah. And sometimes that that has le- led to difficult conversations of, Hey, it's totally cool. Like if this is not what's working out for you right now, then let's figure out something else or it's okay. Like this particular, this particular iteration of this relationship can end. I love that you have resources for people in those cases as well. Okay. If it's not me, then here are some other coaches, because that's something that I, I try to spend a lot of time thinking about how 
to bring down the walls of competition, the perceived walls of competition that may exist in whatever field you're in. Cause it's, I've realized it's not just in running, like it's, it's in yoga as well. It's when I worked in office jobs, it's the same thing where it's like, no, there's, there is someone for everyone. There's, there is a runner for every coach and there's a coach for every runner. There is enough of everyone that if this doesn't work out, there's something else that you can try. But that's also why, so it's so great that you do the power hours because it's like, okay, here's one hour, real intense. We're going to hear, I'm going to bring it all. I'm going to take it all from you. And then you can go out there and you can do it on your own. And then if that works for you, and now you're even more curious about me, all right, we can come and we can work together on a more consistent basis. So I love that you have those layers of offerings for people because it just, even for you as a coach, it's that adaptability to the various types of athletes that are out there. Yep. Yes. Yeah. I love everything you said. Yeah. I always, something, I always try to assume positive intent with people. So again, if I'm seeing someone miss runs, like I, I never assume that it's because they don't care. I assume like, I know that for the vast majority of people I work with running is like, we're adult runners, right? Like running is not our whole, we have other demands, just like we said on our time running is not our whole world, even if we wish it was right. Um, uh, so I assume, you know, like what is, you know, there's probably something coming up for this person. Like what is, you know, let's check in, see what's going on. And sometimes it does take someone a little bit longer. They need some space to get back to me and that's totally fine. And if I'm just not hearing back from someone for a little bit, I'll say, Hey, I'm here. You check in when you're ready. Um, you know, if you're, you know, maybe something has come up for them. And when you, if you just need a little break from running, whenever you're ready to get back, we will, pick you, we will meet you exactly where you are and reroute you and get you back on track. If someone is consistently, you know, running into issues where they're just not able to put in the work that either, you know, they or we want, um, then that it can be time for a conversation of like, Hey, you know, maybe it's time to adjust our goals a little bit. That's okay. You know, maybe hitting a PR this cycle is not, you just don't have the availability or, the mental or physical time or space to devote to this really big goal. Um, what else can we pivot towards? I guarantee there's something else productive that we can work towards. And it's just, again, a matter of like meeting you where you're at and seeing what goal might be a better fit. If you're not, you know, if you're not able to take the action that is going to be necessary to align with that goal. Which is also a beautiful, it's like a, gosh, I'm, I'm blanking on the word right now. But such a, hey, everyone, this is why you get a run coach. Like here, here's, if you want a reason to get a run coach, she just gave it to you right there because it's your run coach can kind of help you figure out your goals. And I think a run coach is also really helpful in terms of reframing it. So you've said it a few times where it's like, okay, maybe this isn't a PR race. Maybe this is something else. And oftentimes I think, again, it's that permission to do things differently than what maybe we initially set out to do, or maybe what we think we're supposed to do as runners. So I love that you bring that up because there are, and again, going back to that idea of being a runner is more than just running is that there's many different ways to show up within running. You can, maybe you still do that race, but you don't race it. Right. Or maybe I had, I had a race this past weekend And I went into that race with three goals. And afterwards I thought about it. I'm like, oh, okay. If I had to describe the goals, it was very much so. One of them was a process goal. Like, let me practice nutrition, see how it feels. Another one was a feeling goal, which was just how do I want to feel throughout the race? Can I run in a way that is going to help me feel that way better? And then the third one was a time goal. It wasn't, there was no hierarchy to it, but I definitely went in there with three different goals. And that was the clarity from that really came from my coach because I was, even after running for as long as I have, I still was operating under this assumption that like, oh, I had to have one A goal and that A goal should be a time goal. And my coach was like, no, like why? Like It doesn't have to be that. And again, it's like, I share that because it's, it's a great reminder that even as we evolve and as we grow as runners, it is sometimes really easy to fall back into thinking our goals have to be metric based 
PR or get a personal best or um, one I often hear too is, oh, I, I'm, I'm doing the same race that I did last year and I just want to get a faster time than I did last year. Not necessarily a PR, but I want to perform better. So it's just such a great reminder that your coach will help you kind of sift through of, okay, so you still want to run, but maybe let's have a different kind of goal that does fit in with your life, that does fit in with the stressors and the demands of life. And that fits in a way that you really do feel good about what you're doing and you feel like you can commit to it as well. Absolutely. Structure, intention, clarity. Those are all things that a coach can give you. Um, and things that I think people are very poor at giving themselves, right. Especially like that clarity. Um, so having that objective third party can be so helpful and invaluable. Having someone help you reframe when, you know, if life is throwing you curveballs or something, you know, creates a less than ideal circumstance going into the race or going into the training cycle. I feel like I've become such a whiz at that over the past couple of years since COVID. Um, I mean, just such I've had people pivot have to pivot a million different ways. I've had people who, you know, had a lot of anxiety and depression, maybe like mental health struggles as a result of, it was a really hard period for a lot of people. I've had people have job changes. I've had people, um, unrelated to COVID just go through like illnesses and personal health issues. Um, I love working with folks, helping them towards big, juicy, meaty PRs like that is fun, but there's so many other ways to support someone through their running journey. And sometimes we set out, you know, I work with someone and they're, they come in, they have these big juicy PR goals. And that is like the reason for hiring a coach. Um, and then for, for some reason, you know, something happens and we have to pivot and I still having a coach can still lend you so much value because, you know, as runners, we tend to be type A, we tend to be goal oriented. It's very easy to just fixate on that. Like we measure running success based on time and PRs. Um, but if something happens, there's still something I try to encourage people. If you can just reframe your expectations a little bit, um, if you can set some different goals, there are so many ways to find pleasure in running. Um, mm -hmm. it might not be, that might mean that pleasure and fulfillment and joy. Um, and you can walk away from a race being like, yes, I crushed my goals. I feel fulfilled. I feel, I feel strong. You know, I achieved everything I want out of that. And that you could have been very far away from a PR or not have gotten that PR. Um, and there's seasons of life when you probably will have to, you know, adjust expectations or approach races from that perspective. And that doesn't mean that PRs are off the table. You know, it just, you know, maybe next training cycle is a training cycle for PRs, but this one, you just have to, you know, focus on, I love the goal of nailing nutrition and hydration of nailing, you know, maybe you run your best paced race or your, your smartest paced race. Maybe you work on any number of these like process-based racing goals mm -hmm. that, and you can still, you, you know, you can achieve those and finish the race and feel like awesome and and really accomplished and confident. And that's a great feeling. And that has nothing to do with time. I love that because it's shows how dynamic running can be. And I know that's where, where I've been with running and my own personal, my own personal journey or view of the running community and whatnot is, is striking that balance of you can still have your time goals, but the time isn't the only thing that should be driving you. There is so much more to get out of running, especially I'm going to assume you're in the same boat as me, especially when we're such lovers of this sport and want to be in the sport for as long as we can. If mine, the, the number I'm more concerned with right now is, oh, can I run for the next 30 years, right? Can I run in a way that's going to allow me to continue to run versus that PR? But there's still those moments. And I, again, I experienced this with this race where it's even though I met or came very close to the time goal that I had established for myself, there is still this like, oh, but it wasn't as fast as other times. And it's like, but wait, it doesn't matter. Like it's, you know, who, why am I worrying about those other times when those other, it's, it's in the past. But it does take one awareness that those thoughts are starting to come in, the ability to reflect, the ability to reframe it as, wait, but that wasn't the only goal or that wasn't the main goal or that wasn't even the purpose 
for this particular run. It was, I didn't go into that race or, you know, I didn't go into that race thinking, oh, this is going to be a PR race. I went into this race thinking this is based on where I am mentally with running. This is what I think I can do. So it's, it's always so interesting for me as I continue to journey through this life as a runner of embracing who I am. And I know that's something that's really important to you of like embracing who I am in this season of running without having to add any little qualifiers or quantifiers or any of that to who I am as a runner and simply being like, this is where I'm at. I'm going to celebrate it. I'm going to be happy with that because I am still showing up. I'm still running. And I even had this, this realization of, but I'm still doing it, right? Like for me, it's, I've been running for a decade. And if I get caught up in today's race numbers, then what kind of service am I doing to an entire decade's worth of running and the desire to be looking forward and running for the next decade? Yep. Yeah. Very similar to that's such a great way to put it. Very similar to how we talked about is if you don't accept and identify yourself as a runner or an athlete, when you're, you know, just beginning or when you're just getting into it, you might never identify, right? Like if you tie it to achieving something, you might never be able to identify because there's always going to be further, you know, markers to achieve and more and more to do. Um, I feel very similarly about racing goals If you can't, so I, something I tell all my runners is regardless of it is, if it is your worst race ever, or your very best race ever, there will always be something that you did well and that you can celebrate. And there will always be something that you can work on. That's true, regardless of how the race goes. And if you approach it from that perspective, um, it's such a healthier way to look at it. If you approach, if you wait for, you know, the race where every single thing goes right, you're never going to be happy. You have to learn to find some kind of contentment in every single race, or you will truly never be satisfied with your performance. There will always be more. You're going to spend your whole running career just chasing this external, you know, thing that's probably not achievable because let's be honest, even in our best PR races, I guarantee all of us again, can find something that they could have done better to optimize that last, you know, I could just get those extra seconds or that extra. So that contentment starts, it's, you know, it's something that has to be practiced every single race. It starts right from the beginning of your running career carries all the way through the middle of your running career. Um, so, you know, that growth mindset and that process-based mindset of, you know, regardless of the end time, what can I celebrate? What can I find here to celebrate? And then what is great feedback for me that I want to, what do I want to continue to work on and pour into my next training cycle? I love that so much because it is so true that there's something to learn from every single race experience, every all of them, all of them. And I think back and I'll, and I'll share this as as the example here where for my marathon PR, right. It was, it's my marathon PR. And when afterwards, when I looked at it, I was so happy. I was just so happy that I got the PR, but similar when I looked back, I'm like, okay, so what can I celebrate a PR? What can I do better? I can learn how to have even splits because It was totally first half of the race was one time and it was the most positive split race (laughs) of my life. Like I've never had a race more positively split than that. It was still a PR. Like it still had that, the celebration of here, I did something faster and harder. It's something I didn't think I could do. And yet where can I improve? It's that, it's that process of how can I go back and maybe next time around be a little bit steadier with the paces or maybe run in a way that leads to a negative split instead of a positive split. And even, I love that you said the things celebrating both because going back to the race this past weekend, I celebrated that I felt the steadiest I have felt at this point. Yes. Right? Like this was my um, 11th running of this particular event. And I already know going into that race that it's going to suck. Like I just never perform well. It's always a challenge, but this year I smiled the entire time because I felt steady. I felt in control. Like I felt very present. So that was my celebration. And then what could I learn? I could learn that like the, the main most glaring thing that I took out of that race 
was how much more I need to hydrate in the lead up to my races. So it was that I love that you're inviting people to celebrate themselves, but then also think about where is there something that I can improve upon? Because yeah, even in the best of racing experiences, there's still going to be something, even in the best of racing experiences, there's still going to be a moment where you doubt yourself. So maybe that's the improvement of, okay, at what point did that doubt come up? And, you know, is that a point where maybe if I would have taken some fuel 10 minutes before that, instead of waiting, wherever the case is, we're again, inviting more of that curiosity into all these experiences. So I absolutely, I just, I was just like snapping in my head. I'm (laughs) snapping now because I love that because I think we tend to hyper-focus on, oh, here's the good race. Here's the PR. But to your point, the minute you meet that one goal, particularly if it's a time goal or something related to a number, yes, you're going to sit in that. But us runners, very quickly, we start thinking about either can we repeat that time or can we better that time? I've never had, I've never had a runner have a like, you know, I've had runners make huge breakthroughs, like drop a ton of time from one race to the other. I've never had a runner ever run a single race where we cannot find something that like was not optimized that we can continue to work on optimizing. And in saying that, I want to be very clear. That does not mean that you should not celebrate that race. That's more evidence to celebrate that race because there's not like you can go to the mountaintop and there is still going to be something that you can work on improving, which is a beautiful thing and the beautiful thing of running, but that's not a reason to like, you know, not delay celebration or, you know, say, well, you know, I ran this massive PR, but like, no, you ran this massive PR, you ran whatever your achievement was, celebrate that, take stock in that, revel in that. But then, you know, when you're recapping, go, you know, back through again, I guarantee, even if it was an amazing race, I've never had a a situation where we've not been able to, you know, where everything went hundred percent perfectly. And there's not been something that we can continue to pour into our training and continue to work on. And then similarly with bad races is I tell people if, if a race made you better and bad races always will make you better because there's, you take those learnings. That's so valuable. It was not a wasted or a bad race. It just, you just maybe didn't achieve some of your goals. That's great data and great feedback. And that just informs, you know, how you go forward. Sometimes there's also bad races where I tell people not to put a lot of stock into it. It just is what it is. Like this was just like mm-hmm. a fluke or too many things just happen outside of our control. Like, let's just, you know, let's leave this one behind and just focus on what's ahead. Um, but truly if a race made you better, it is not a wasted race. Um, And similarly for good races, there will always be, you know, that's the beauty of there's always room to continue to refine things. Even if it's, you know, even if at some point you just kind of start working on like tweaking the one last one to 2% of things, still more to work on. It's a fun part. Yeah. And that's like even something as simple as maybe your reflection is that whatever you wore that day, like (laughs) I I think of it as like for, uh, you know, for us as women with sports bras, like, Hey, maybe your takeaway was that that particular bra chafed when you were running your PR pace with that weather and I'm never going to wear it again. But I, it's again, I love the invitation, but I also want to point out that it's us label. I feel like in particularly with bad, when we label things bad, it's so subjective (laughs) what that is, because I can think back to some of my bad races and it's all about perspective because I can tell someone I had a really bad marathon experience I've talked about this before. And I remember in the aftermath of that, and I just say that that was the worst marathon I've ever ran. It was so bad. And yet I would talk to people and they were just so amazed that I even ran a marathon. So it's like, oh, that bad is, that's the label I've created. That's the emotion I've attached to it. Other people don't care. Like, and I would say even as a coach, not to say that you don't care that it's being labeled as bad, but as a coach, you're thinking, okay, so what can we learn from this experience? Where, where did this leave you? Did this leave you with wanting to go after that particular distance again? Like to me, it's now being on the other side of things where it's like, oh no, here, this is just more information for us to gather so that we can determine what's the path forward. Maybe the path forward includes never running that distance again. Maybe the path forward includes 
taking it really easy with running because your heart needs a break, your mind needs a break. Maybe the path forward is let's find you a redemption race and let's kind of go that way. So even the labeling of a race as bad or good, it, it's 100% subjective to the individual person. So I, again, I just like that your invitation is to take a step back from the experience and celebrate what you can celebrate, lament what you want to lament, but also take stock of what did work and what didn't work. Because to your point in every single race, there, there is going to be stuff that worked. There's going to be stuff that didn't work. You can run your PR and it was the same for me. I had my PR race and the next marathon training cycle, the fueling that I used during that PR race did not sit well with my stomach. And I had to go back to the drawing board. So it's like, it, it all changes. I have, we're going to do these rapid fire style. These next two questions. How would you describe in one sentence, your coaching style? Oh, in one sentence, um, I would say, um, hyper personalized and customized and meets you hyper personalized, customized and informed. Um, but meets you where you're at and meets you where you're at. Um, the informed is important. I strive everything, uh, my entire coaching philosophy, and this is a big part of the stuff that I put out on social media as well. I strive to make it as evidence-based as possible. So again, giving you all the facts, making sure that we're not just replicating things mm -hmm. that work well for one person, but that's actually informed by research and sports science and, you know, exercise physiology. Um, that education is an important component to me. Yeah. Education is definitely very important to you. And I love, and I think that's, those two words were the words that I failed to find in my introduction for you. When I was saying that your information just feels so like accurate and it's because it's evidence-based, like you're not saying, Hey, I just ran five miles and this is what I did. And you should do it too. You're like, no, this is what the research is showing. This is what feedback. There's just so much more to it. And it just, again, it's, the way you present information is, is very rooted in, I, I don't want to say believability because I don't think that's the right word, but it is, it is that evidence-based makes it feel so much more tangible and like anyone can use what you're saying versus thinking, oh no, this only applies to a certain population or to a certain group of runners. So I just, I really, really appreciate how you give information out to people. All right. The second question, again, in one sentence, how would you describe or what would you say is your coaching philosophy? Coaching philosophy is giving people, um, empowering people, informing them and walking the journey alongside them at their own, at their own pace and towards their, towards their own goals. I love that. I love that because a coach is, is so invested in what you're doing, regardless of what the goal is, regardless of the number goal, like it's just, it's, it's such a special relationship and maybe I'm just feeling extra emotional about all of this because this is the last <laughs> conversation, but I'm like, it's just such a special relationship that, that athletes have with coaches and to have athletes and trust you with this aspect of their lives. It really is something that I know I do. And I'm sure you do take very seriously because it is, it is an honor there. There is again, and kind of going back to what I said, where there's a lot of coaches, there's someone for everyone. And, but the people who are with you chose you and you chose them. So it's just so great. The final question that I have, and there is no right or wrong answer to this. It's just your thoughts. How can we make running more accessible and inclusive? I would say, um, that's a great question. That's something I've been reflecting on. Um, so more inclusive is I have a number of goals, um, and I have on my pin posts on social media and I have to find a place to put this on my website as well, but on my pin posts, I have, um, 
some things that I'm committed to in 2023 doing to make my business more inclusive. So doing, um, one of my goals is to invest in some, um, diversity training. Um, I'm considering, I would love to offer scholarship, run coaching scholarship, um, to those from marginalized communities who have an interest in running, maybe want to get their foot in the door with running, but just need some tools and support. Um, so investing in that type of work is a big goal of mine for 2023. Um, and I guess I would say just having coaches have more conversations about what they can do, um, and having coaches get more curious and reflective, um, on, on, you know, initiatives that each of us can take. Yeah, I, that has been, I think the purpose of me asking the question now that I can fully reflect on it, the purpose of me asking the question is because it's so important for us to have the conversations. It starts with a conversation of asking, how can we make running as a whole better? How can we make what we offer better? How can we make the space of running feel more inclusive, feel more attainable? Because we're we're definitely going through a shift in running where, you know, 10 years ago, most of us probably thought run coaches were only for elites or only for athletes, athletes in schools, your collegiate athletes. And now it's definitely very much whatever the pendulum is or however we want to see it. It has swung in a direction where no run coaches are there to help whoever wants the help. But with all that, we almost need to reframe the system to figure out, okay, so if we are here to help everybody who wants to be a runner, then we do have to have those conversations of what are the barriers for people, whether it be sidewalks in your community or access to shoes and clothes, or even hear someone who would really love to work with a coach and would, would benefit from having a coach, but they can't necessarily afford yeah, monthly. Right. Yeah. So everyone has such a, and that's truly been one of my favorite questions throughout this entire series, because even if everyone has a slightly different answer. The themes are all the same of one, we have to talk about these things, but then we have to figure out where are the different entry points for people that maybe aren't as easy to get to as they should be, or as they could be. And it is really inspiring to hear that you're taking that initiative within yourself and within your business of, okay, so I recognize I need to do some kind of trainings and I need to educate myself. But then I also recognize that there needs to be an opportunity for scholarships and how, what does that look like? Because how does that, how does that work within your business model? How do you work with picking people for a scholarship? Like that's a whole process that you have to figure out for yourself and even just asking yourself, how you want to go about that, right? Because then it's, it, and it, I just, this question I love and thank you for letting me go off a little bit here because it's so much more like, yes, you can make your coaching services more accessible for people, but then are the races where they're going, are they affordable? Are they accessible? And this is my, the race that I had on Sunday. Again, it's my, it's a race I run every single year. and. This year, I'm feeling a little more confused about the race because it is now, and I signed up for next year's event out of sentimentality, but for the half marathon, it's $140 to sign up to do that race. And as I sit here post-race thinking about that, all I can think about is how is that it how is that possible for a lot of people, right? Like that's just a race entry not including anything else, not including your training plan, your gear, not including anything else. And it's, again, this question of so many different moving pieces within running. And it all begins with us asking the questions and talking about it and then figuring out how we can learn from each other. So then we can ask those questions of someone else or bring those points up to someone else. So I really, I really appreciate that your and I'm not surprised 
that you're trying to educate yourself to figure out what makes sense for you and for your community as well. Yeah, it's been something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, and there's been, yeah, it's something I've been thinking a lot about from a lot of different angles. I think running is something that has attracted so many of us to running is that it is this like supposedly very simple sport. Like you just need your running shoes and you run, but like, you know, first of all, that assumes that you have safe access. You have, you know, access to safe places to run. That is not the case for a lot of people that assumes that you have leisure time to run. That's not the case for people who are just trying to make ends meet. But as all of us who have been running for such a long time, no running gives so much to our lives. It makes us better people. It enri- like it has such a ripple effect, like we talked about in so many areas of our lives. And I would love to just something that I'm exploring, you know, how can I, um, in some small way, you know, help, other people experience the benefits of running, reach more people who maybe it is their barrier to entry is for, you know, for social and financial reasons and safety and security reasons, it's just higher. Um, so definitely something that I'm thinking about, but yeah, the, the idea that running is a simple free and expensive sport is not necessarily the case. Race fees are like astronomical now. So I can completely empathize with, um, yeah, put some folks in some hard decisions or some hard places. Yeah, it's, yeah, uh, listen, I had all day today, I've been like, okay, I don't know how I feel. I'm feeling very, uh, very confused. I've never felt so confused after a race in my life where I'm like, okay, for sentimental reasons, but then there's, I don't even know if it's a moral reason where it's my, my questioning is very much. So I feel like over the past year, just even wondering what's the impact of races on the communities that they're in and yep. how how accessible are they and what is the strain on the communities where these races take place and that's just like bigger conversations but it's things that that I I am beginning to wonder because to your point of this sport is so wonderful and it's so great and yet there are, there are barriers in place where there are things that, that do prevent people from engaging in it, in a meaningful, fulfilling, affirming way. Thank you for that. Um, final request is if you can just tell us where we can get more information about you, your Instagram handle, website, what's, the best way to get in contact with you. And then also if you have anything fun and exciting coming up, please feel free to share. Yeah. So the best way to find me, um, I'm on social media at my handle is just coach Montana D Pasquale, all lowercase, no spaces. Um, and then my website is coach Montana D Um, you should all come up on Google if you search me as well. Um, but that's the way to find me. If you have any, um, Um, my email is, my email is connected with my social media accounts. So there should be an email me button. You can also DM me, um, for any, any questions, but, um, as far as things I have coming up, so I have an awesome new, if you are looking for strength training for your running, um, I have a great app-based program that opens, um, we do two to three month cycles together. I have more information about that on my website, folks have been getting really great results from that so far. And it's been a ton of fun. There's a virtual community involved too. So you get support, um, access to me for any questions asked. Um, and then, um, in May, I will be launching two small group cohorts. So it's like group coaching, but better is the way that I'm framing it. Um, just because it is a smaller group, we get really, we spend quite a few months together, really get to dig into our goals. Um, you get, you know, the experience of having teammates and camaraderie and Mm. people have similar goals to you. Um, so I have one that is a high performance team for women who are, um, for women half and full marathoners that meet certain performance standards. And then I have a program coming out called the road to Boston, which are um, for those who are on the cusp of a BQ time um, and are looking for others who are, you know, chasing that goal together. Um, We dig in, we do a base building cycle together and then go into a marathon build. um, And you get a lot of um, support and encouragement and of course, great training to, um, you know, help us all work towards that goal together. I love all of that. I just love that so much because community is so important to me and connecting with other runners is incredibly important to me, but it's so in line with what you like to do where you're like, no, I'm asking you to commit to me 
for more than just a training. Like you were like, there's a base building phase and then we get into the marathon training phase. So I love how, again, with everything that you do, there's just so much intentionality to it that I, I can't imagine just... I, I can't even begin to imagine the level of care and passion you bring to the things that you do because of how intentional you are with them. That's going to be so great. I can't wait to see you share more information about that. Hopefully you share some about the teammates because I will, from the sidelines, be cheering <laughs> everyone on as they work towards those goals. And it's just, it's so empowering. It really is empowering when you're with a group of other people who are chasing the same goals. And then you have a coach who is as compassionate and caring as you are kind of guiding that. I'm going to be really excited to see how that all comes together for you. And I'm just excited that you're creating stuff like this for people out there. So any final words for us? No, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on. I had a great time. Um, such a fun conversation. And thanks for amplifying women's women coaches' voices. Yeah, we got we got to do it. We got if we're if we're not doing it for each other, we can't expect other people to do it for us. So <laughs> thank you so much. All right, everyone. Until the next season. See y'all soon. Bye.